Okay, so yes, I am going to be speaking this morning. Uh, I'll be completely honest with you, I didn't want to speak this morning. Um, in fact, when I was playing, woo. <laughs> and I'm not going to be either, so goodbye, have a good day. Thanks, Sally. Um, you know, I was planning the schedule, and I, I had an idea for someone to preach uh, this week, and they couldn't do it. I asked a second person, they couldn't do it. I asked a third person, they couldn't do it. It was very odd. So I went to ask the fourth person, and the Lord just kind of said to me, Mark, don't you get it? I want you to speak. I'm like, oh, okay. And at the moment I said, okay, he gave me what he wanted me to speak about this morning, and it is the subject of anxiety. More crucially, it's specifically about overcoming anxiety. I don't need to be prophetic to know that that's something that we all struggle with. Some may be uh, in more of a, a deeper way than others. Maybe that's something you battle daily. You wake up at five in the morning and your stomach is churning. You're panicking, wondering how on earth you're going to juggle your finances for what seems like the hundredth time to pay the rent, or maybe it's just a school uniform. You're having breakfast with the kids, but if the truth be told, you're not really present. You're worried about the meeting that's coming up and about your co-workers. Your phone buzzes and got another, another notification from my bank saying I'm overdrawn again. Maybe I'm talking about you this morning. Maybe that's you. Maybe you can identify with that. Well, I'll tell you something. I can certainly identify with it. You know, I don't speak to you this morning out of some academic pursuit to work out how to speak on anxiety. I speak from my own story too. Because anxiety is something that I've struggled with my whole life pretty much. Fear has always been there and the result in anxiety that comes from that. And so what I share with you this morning is is really a, part of my own battle and struggle with anxiety and how I'm winning that war as I spend time in God's word and allow his spirit to minister to me. And that's what I want to share with you all this morning. And I think the truth is we see around us, don't we, an exponential increase in anxiety. Um, But isn't it curious that in some respects, don't you think we should see it less in our safety conscious, tech enabled, modern world? Aren't we rich enough and smart enough to uh, eradicate all those anxiety triggers? And yet, with the promise of stress-free living, if you get this new convenient app, it seems to be that anxiety is on the increase. How does that work? Don't get me started. The promise of convenience is the promise that you can squeeze even more into your life the promise that you can do even more than you've done. And it's just as I was reading recently, Stephanie I, Peter Scazzaro, about emotionally healthy leadership. You do damage, you do violence to your soul. And so we know it's all around. I don't need to give you stats, but here's an interesting one. One in four people in this room, in the UK, will experience some kind of mental health problem this year. And we feel it, we see it all around. Now, what does the Bible say about the consequences of anxiety. I don't need to tell you it's not a good thing. Of course, we know this. You know, it says in Psalm 37 verse 8, fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. You know, firstly, anxiety harms our bodies, doesn't it? We tense up, we get headaches, our blood pressure can rise leading to possibly heart disease. We may experience chest pains and panic attacks. Our stomach churns, we lose our appetite, we cannot sleep, and our thinking is akin to a dense fog that we are trying to navigate through. Let me tell you, friends, God does not want us to live that kind of life. That isn't God's best for you, and it isn't God's best for me, and we don't have to stay in that place. When God says, do not fret, he's not trying to take away something that we want, is he? It's not like, please don't take away anxiety. I really enjoy it. We often think God's that kind of God that wants to take good things from you. No, the opposite is true. God says, do not fret. He's protecting us from a way of life which can bring harm 
But you know, it's not just physical that anxiety impacts us, is it? Anxiety also impacts our relationship with Jesus and with one another. How so? Well, do we know the famous verse, 1 John 4, 18, perfect love casts out fear. Do we know that? But have you noticed that the opposite can be true? You see, if you let fear and anxiety gain ground, and if it becomes the predominant thought pattern in your mind, what happens is it seems to squeeze out love and peace. Why do I say that? Listen, just just listen to me. You either operate out of love and peace or you operate out of fear and anxiety. You only ever operate out of those two places. You might be on the scale of that, but we only operate out of those two places and God wants us to operate out of love and of peace. And so being filled with fear and resultant anxiety means that we start operating outside of the manufacturer's guidelines. It's essentially what it means. And what happens? We find it difficult to discern what's of God and what's not when we're fearful, right? I'm just sharing you, this is my list I put together. We find it difficult to serve and love others, don't we? Because we're so focused on survival that we don't have the capacity of love to serve others. We can't study God's word and we can't pray because our thoughts are so distracted by the fears and the anxiety that we are battling, right? We can't enjoy family and friends because we cannot be present in the moment because fear propels us into a future that won't exist. And we live in that place. The enemy does not want you to be present in the moment He wants you to either be chained to your past out of regret or propelled into a future that doesn't exist out of fear. Did you see Jesus ever worry or hurry? But he was present in the moment. That is the life that that God is calling each one of us to live in. We find it difficult to be still and know that he is God because being still is not something we can do. And at its heart, it means we start operating outside of our identity as a child of God. At its heart, having a thought pattern of fear and anxiety means that we live outside of sonship and daughter. Now, I'm discovering this personally, guys, that at its root, Fear and resulting anxiety is a sign that I'm not living my life out of the sonship. Why do I say that? Let me give you this interesting quote. I'm reading a book at the moment called Unbound by Neil Lazano. Uh, It's about deliverance ministry and about deliverance, but he says this interesting thing that I want to read to you. I believe that most of our spiritual freedom comes when we learn the truth of who God is And listen, we actually believe what he has said about himself, about us, and about his workings in our lives. If we actually believed about who God is, what he says about himself, and he says about us, then that's where spiritual freedom is. To put it another way, I've heard that anxiety is exalting another ideal over what Jesus has promised. I'm really getting to the root of this here, okay? Because I've seen it. If I recognize that God loves me and he's got a plan for my life and he'll always be there for me, if I live in that truth, that exalts itself over the lie that God doesn't love me, that he's not really real, and that he'll take care of your friend but not you because how bad of a person you are. And you see, when you live in sonship, what you do, you see, is you live in freedom to be all that he's created you to be. And you see, just as God has a plan for you, I want to tell you something, the devil has a plan for you as well. He's got a bespoke plan for your life, the enemy. He knows, and we're going to look at this in a moment, he knows the entry points to get you. 
He set up these fortresses where he acts out of. He knows where your weaknesses are. And you see, we need to understand that we are in a battle. In fact, I want us to look briefly before I go into our key text for this morning. That's a long introduction. Uh, to Chris Ryan, you don't mind being here until three o'clock, do you? I've got a woo. Great stuff. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5. This is what Paul says to the church in Corinth. And this is a very famous passage. He says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. But our warfare, or for the weapons of our warfare, are not of the flesh. In other words, when we go to battle, we don't go, right, put them up, devil. That's not the weapons we use. We don't use our fisticuffs, whatever you have as a weapon. But our weapons have divine power to destroy what? Strongholds. And then it tells you what a stronghold is. We destroy, here's the stronghold, arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Anything that exalts itself over the truth of God is a stronghold that can operate in your life. And so what does Paul say? Therefore, take every thought captive to obey Christ. Why? Because the battle is in our mind. The battle is in our mind. That is where the warfare is going on. But I've got good news for you. God has given us the weapons to fight. You know, how can we live out that place of sonship and and in the place of love and peace? Now, let me just say from the get-go that I cannot stand here and tell you that you're going to walk out of these doors and you will never, ever experience anxiety again, ever. And if you thought I was leading to that point, I'm sorry to disappoint you. But what I can promise is that God calls us to live a life where we can be overcomers in this area. And that we can see progressive freedom in this area. Now, I don't want to put God in the box. He may miraculously come this morning, I've been praying for this, and completely break in and you won't be anxious about a particular area. And I have faith for that. That can happen. But for some of you, this is going to be a journey that you're going to start this morning to commit on. And I also want to say this, if you suffer from anxiety, if you are seeking professional help or you're on medication, If that is you, and I want to say, I've been there too. I've been on medication. I've had times where I've woken up in the morning, haven't been able to get out of bed, and where someone would just say hello, and I start crying, and the world feels like it's on top of me, and I've been on medication. I want to say, if that's you, you are not a second-class Christian. Did you just hear what I said? You are not a second-class Christian. You are human. Jesus says you will have trials and troubles in this life. But Jesus has come that we may overcome. And with that, let us turn to our main text this morning, which is found in Philippians. You are not going to be surprised at where I'm going to. It's a very popular passage, of course, for good reason. Philippians 4, verses 4 to 8. I'm going to read this. And in the time that is allowed for me, we are going to unpack this together and see how we respond to anxiety and overcome it. It says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, present your request to God. And thanksgiving it says. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and indeed sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Lord, I just pray that as we unpack your word this morning, you would just protect our minds from the enemy who would seek to distract us. Would we hear your truth? And thank you that your word says that your word will 
accomplish that which it is set forth to do. Ask this in your name. Amen. Now, the thing about this passage is that we have this most amazing promise, don't we, of peace. It's a peace which will guard our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You know, the world would say to you that peace is an absence of things. Peace is an absence of the things that bother you. I just, I just need a bit of peace. If I can just sort that out, it'll be fine. If I can just have a day to myself, ah, oh, I can wait. If I can just, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I will experience peace. But can I tell you the truth? Peace is not the absence of things. It is the presence of something. Peace is the presence of Jesus. Peace is not the absence of things. If your pursuit is to create a perfect life where you can live in peace, it will not happen. That is akin to building your house upon the sand. But you see, a peace which surpasses all understanding is because irrespective of the things around you, your peace is based on the very presence and person of Jesus. That is what. It's the same peace that when Jesus could sleep in a storm, the disciples are going, ah! <coughs> excuse me, where did that come from? <laughs> it's a very manly, ah! um, but Jesus could sleep. Why? Because of the peace which surpasses understanding. And by the way, he knew his sonship. He knew he was the only begotten son. He knew that his father loved him. We're learning, uh, Steph has got these scripture cards, and we learn it as a family this week. It's Hebrews 13. Uh, I believe it is. What shall we fear? What can mere mortal men do to me? Like, <laughs> what can man do to me? I'm his. And you know, this surpasses all understanding, sets up a guard. It's a military term. It means essentially that it, it puts a guard in front of your heart and your mind, where your will and your emotions are, against what? the fear that comes to attack. Now, hands up if you want that kind of peace. Amen. I think everyone should be putting their hand up. I want that kind of peace. Well, that's available. How is it available? Good question. I'm glad you asked. Essentially, the, the important thing about this passage is that the, the, the promise is sandwiched in between two conditions. Now, some of God's promises are unconditional. For example, God said, I will, I will not destroy the world again with a flood. That is an unconditional promise. But some of God's promises are conditional on us. For example, salvation. Just because Jesus died on the cross does not mean that you are saved unless you say, you confess your sins and say, Jesus, would you be my savior, right? It's a conditional promise. That peace that you want, there's a condition. In other words, there's something for you to do. Okay, there's something for us to do, and that's what we're going to look at. And as I was thinking about it, the first part that we're going to look at, do not be anxious about anything, but everything with prayer and petition and, pre and thanksgiving, present your request to God. The first part is, if you like, how we deal with the anxiety when it hits. Okay, what do we do when we feel anxious? The second part is how we protect ourselves from the frequency of occurrence. Okay. I, I have had uh, asthma over many years. It's not mine. I, I don't own that by saying I have had asthma, but you know what I mean. And I had two inhalers, a blue one and a brown one. The blue one is to be used when your lungs constrict and you need oxygen or you need them to essentially get bigger. The brown one you're supposed to take every day in order to reduce the occurrence of those attacks. And so what I'm saying here is these two conditions are like the blue inhaler and the brown inhaler. One of them is what you do when anxiety hits, but you can reduce the frequency of that by making sure you take that brown inhaler as well. And that's the second part, you see, of the condition. You see, what happens when we use this scripture, do not be anxious about everything, with everything, with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present requests to God and the peace of God, which is possible understanding, guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. We do that and we go, okay. But we don't look at the next bit. But that is just so crucial. So let's look at the first bit. Let's go through this together. 
Number one, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. This is a blue inhaler, by the way. Do not ponder your problem. Praise your provider. Listen, do not ponder your problem. Praise your provider. In that moment, rejoice. You know what I, last two weeks ago, Steph and the kids were away um, on holiday with um, Steph's sister and kids. And I had the, the week to myself, well, four days to myself, which I thought would be a most amazing time. But I've got to be honest with you, I suffered with really bad anxiety. Every morning I woke up, maybe four in the morning, and it would be a panic over finances or something else. And I, I would have to catch my breath. And I had to make a choice to start rejoicing. I had to make a choice to put my eyes on Jesus. I had to make a choice to start rejoicing. And that's the first thing we need to do, rejoice. And it's a, isn't it interesting when Peter, do you remember Peter walked on the water? There's a storm. Peter walks on the water because uh, Jesus said, come on over. He comes on over. But the moment he took his eyes off Jesus and onto the water, what happened? He sunk. You see, don't ponder your problem. Praise your provider. And we also see this play out with the 12 spies in number, is it Numbers 12? Numbers 13? 10 of them come back full of anxiety. Oh my word, those giants are huge. We are but grasshoppers. But what about Joshua and Caleb? Sheesh. Yeah, there might be giants. There's a reality of the situation, but our God's bigger. Why? Because they had fixed their eyes on how big God was. And so I want to tell you, the first thing you do is rejoice. But you've got to make a choice to do that. You've got to stop yourselves in your tracks. This is holding thought, every thought captive that exalts itself over God's truth. And you start rejoicing. Number two, the Lord is at hand, it says. We need to recognize that God is with us in that moment. That God hasn't abandoned you. Thank you, Lord, that you are here with me. And do you know what I try and do? I just pause and say, Lord, I just, just presence yourself with me. Lord, thank you that you're with me. Thank you that you're with me. Would I know that you're with me? God? Would I be still and know that you're my God? In that moment when anxiety hits, I rejoice and I recognize, two R's there for you, that God is at hand. Number three, it says this, do not be anxious for anything. What does anything mean? Anybody? Thank you. Everything. You know, the Greek is actually written in what is called the active voice. It means that it is an ongoing active state. It means it is a life of per perpetual or continual anxiety. So to translate this, you would say, do not allow yourself to be trapped in a cycle of continuous anxiety. That's what it means. I, I, you know, one of, my, one of my favorite authors is Max Lucado. Anyone know him? Yeah, great writer. I'm reading one of his books at the moment, which is called Fearless. I can recommend that if you're looking for a book on fear. And he said this, the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety is optional. I couldn't do better than that. The presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety is optional. You see, anxiety, I mean, the reason Paul said do not be anxious is because that's what assails us. You know, let's not, let's be real. I mean, Paul, by the way, let's remember this context, was shackled up in a prison in Rome when he, you know, when he wrote this. And here he's saying is, do not worry. But Paul, you have got a lot to worry about, my friend. He's like, don't worry. Why? He knew he, he had his sonship. Like, he knew he was God's. It's like, what can mere mortal man do to me? Right, then let's move on in this conditional. This is the bit. Are you ready? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. I find this very interesting that we're talking about anxiety and all of a sudden we've got to give a request. Why? Anxiety exists because we have a real or perceived need which we fear cannot and won't be met. I know it's a long sentence. I tried my best to put it to you in a shorter way, but I couldn't. I'm going to say it again. Anxiety exists because we have a real or perceived need which we fear cannot and won't be met. For example, Lord, I'm really anxious about the bills. You need to provide the money that I don't have, that I don't think I have. Lord, I'm really anxious about that meeting because 
You know what I'm like. I don't know what words to use. Lord, I have that request. You see, if you felt as if you could meet that need, you would not be anxious, right? And so Paul, I love how Paul is so real about it. It's like, just, just go to God with it. You've clearly got anxiety because there's a perceived or real need that you fear won't be met. Go to God with that need. You know, it says in James, you do not have because you do not ask. Do you remember that? Now, let's just, let's just say it like it is. It means that you lack because of prayerlessness. Is that what it says? You do not have because you do not ask, which means you lack because of prayerlessness. I think I can say that, and, and it's okay to say that, right? Listen, let me put it this way. There is a cost we bear if we do not pray. I have been so challenged these past six to eight weeks on my prayer life, not in a condemnatory way, but in a, the heart of a father who is wooing me to himself, saying, you just don't spend enough time with me, son. You need to pray more. There is a cost that you are paying, Mark. There is a price that you are bearing, Mark, because of your prayerlessness. But you know what? This is the thing about conviction versus condemnation. Conviction woos you to him. Conviction excites your spirit. Conviction invites you to something better. Condemnation gets you into bondage, of course. That's what the enemy does. But conviction from the Holy Spirit and I sense that there are some of you in here, in fact, more than a few, that right now the Holy Spirit is convicting you about your prayer life. But don't you just feel that a little bit of excitement about that? You mean he's inviting me to spend time with him? You do not have because you do not ask. You know, our sonship, and I use that phrase to mean daughters and sons. It's just easier for me to say. Our sonship tells us that our father wants to bless us and is wanting to hear from us. If you root yourself in sonship, that's what it means. Our sonship tells us that father doesn't want us to be in lack. Our sonship tells us that our father says he will provide for our needs. Our sonship tells us that our father has an amazing plan for our lives. And so bringing your petitions, listen, bringing your petitions to God aligns you with sonship. Because what you are doing in bringing your petition to God is declaring the truth of who he is and who you are. When my little boy or my girls come and ask me for something, what are they saying? I am your child and you are my father. You are my provider. The enemy will tell you, don't go to God with that. You've gone too many times or he's not very happy with you at the moment. Because the power in requests is that you declare that you are a child of God. That's why we go with requests, whatever it is. And how do we make that request? With thankfulness. Thankfulness allows us to declare a truth. Listen, thankfulness allows us to declare a truth. Thank you, Lord, that you hear me. Thank you, Lord, that you said you would provide for me. Thank you, Lord, that you hear my request. Thank you, Lord, that you are with me. I am declaring right now in the heavenlies a truth. There is a spiritual dynamic in thankfulness. And by the way, the enemy flees. He hates it. You want the enemy to flee? Start praising and thanking God. Trust me. A garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. So that's the blue inhaler. What do you do when anxiety hits? Rejoice in the Lord always. You make a choice to start rejoicing God. Rather pondering your problem, you praise your provider. Number two, you presence yourself with the Lord. Say, Lord, thank you that you are with me. Number three, you make a choice not to be anxious, but you come to him with your requests. You align yourself in sonship and you declare the truth that he is your father and you do so with thanksgiving. I have to press into this. This doesn't come easy, but the more you do it, the more it becomes a habit and a response to it. Like when, I have, when my asthma hits, I don't even think about going for the blue inhaler now. I just pick it up and We need to make a choice on this conditional promise whether or not we pick up the inhaler and we rejoice and we make a choice. 
to thank him with our requests. Are, are, we, all, are we all good? Okay. Should we look at the brown inhaler? Because there is a way in which we can live our life and reduce the occurrences of the panic attack, the anxiety attack, whatever we need the blue inhaler for. And this is where we mainly miss. And this is where it takes commitment and it takes a choice to live a life that God is calling us to do. You know, it says in uh, Proverbs 12, 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. I think that's true, right? You know, Jimmy Evans, um, he is a great preacher and pastor. He said this, you cannot take a thought out of your mind. You can only replace it with a greater thought. Now, listen, watch. Think about pink elephants. The pink elephants all over the place. Hands up if you're thinking about pink elephants. Funny that. Stop thinking about pink elephants, people. No, no, stop. Who's thinking about pink elephants still? Yeah. Think about a yellow elephant. Yellow elephant. Who's thinking about a yellow elephant right now? You see, another thought will replace it. You can't take a thought out. And you see, this is how it works. Well, this is how it works. When a lie comes in, you can't just pull out the lie. You need to replace it with his truth. It's not about, you see, this is, the battle is in the mind, but it's not a question of mind over matter. It's a question of his truth in your mind, not the lie of the enemy. So when God says, you're going to be in financial ruin, you say, this is what my Lord says. Because if you just say, no, it's going to be fine, and you start trying to work it all out, you won't stop thinking about it. How do I know this? Because I'm talking from personal experience. If I ponder my problem versus praise the provider and get his truth in my brain, it will just still stay there. We have a choice. This is how it works. I want to talk to you about how this works, one of the enemy's tactics. Let me look at that financial ruin one because I think that's pertinent for the season we're in. A lie that you will come to financial ruin becomes a stronghold, or in other words, a fortress, which the enemy uses whenever you look at your bank account, for example. So this is how it works. Somewhere along the line, you've accepted a lie that you will come into financial ruin. Now, these lies can come in in different ways. It could be trauma. You might have had a traumatic experience. It could be through what someone has said over you. It could be through your family of origin, how you've grown up and the environment you've been in. It could be generational stuff. But somewhere along the line through those entry points, this lie of financial ruin or a spirit of poverty has come in. And what happens, you see, if you accept that lie, it gives permission to the enemy to set up a fortress. And then what happens is whenever you do something related to finances, let's say you look at your bank account or you get a bill you've got to pay, he comes out of that fortress, that lie that has given him permission and goes, ah, anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. And you see, the battle is in the mind. We have to get to the root of these areas that the, where the strongholds are set up. That's what we read, didn't we? When we looked at uh, Corinthians, what did it say? Let's remind us. Um, for the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. You see, we need to get to the root of this, and we have the power in the name of Jesus to destroy the strongholds, the fortresses that the enemy has set up, that he operates out of. The lie, okay, the stronghold, the fortress, that no one likes you will operate out of social, in social anxiety sometimes. Or you're going into a new context, they're not going to like me. And you see, the root of that anxiety comes through that fortress of a lie that you might have accepted that no one likes you and you're boring and you're this and you're that. You see how this works? And so let us read the second part of what Paul is saying here for the, blue, for the brown inhaler. Finally, brothers, listen, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there be any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things instead. We get ourselves in a position where we accept the lies of the enemy because we put ourselves in his firing line sometimes. Listen, our ears are the entry point to what we hear. Our eyes are the entry point of what we see. Are we being wise about what we let into our minds? What if we were to use that as a criteria for what we allowed into our bodies? 
This is how I'm trying to live my life. Because I tell you, the more that I dwell on his truth, the more I think about what he says about me, the more the lies are exposed of the enemy and I can deal with them. But I know that if I start slipping and I start listening to the lie of the enemy, if I, the first thing I do when I wake up is look at the Daily Mail headlines about, you know, economic apocalypse. You know, if, if, I, if, I, if I watch things that are not good for my soul, if, the more I do that, it feeds the lie. And I'm like, wow, how comes I'm so anxious right now? Probably because I should be loading myself up with scripture about what Jesus says about me and that he is my provider. I, I know this is a bit strong medicine, uh, but I, I know my heart. Like, this is a battle, guys. Listen, we've got to get serious. Are we taking a battle footing? Because this is what we're in. And the enemy does not want you to move out of a lifestyle of anxiety because when it's in that place, he can demobilize you and you walk out, not out of your sonship. You don't walk in the authority that you have under Christ Jesus. This is why this is so important. So as way of a recap, as I invite the band up, and I realize we're running over slightly. Well, not yet, but I've only got three minutes, apparently. The blue inhaler. What do we do when those anxious thoughts come in? We take the blue inhaler. We rejoice. We recognize that the Lord is at hand. We make a choice not to be anxious, but instead, what do we do? We come to him with our request with thanksgiving. That is the blue inhaler. Hands up who knows how to use the blue inhaler. Right, good. But how do we reduce the occurrences of that? We take the brown inhaler. How do we take the brown inhaler? We make a choice to dwell on his truth and not allow the lie of the enemy to exhort itself over his truth. Okay? Who knows how to take the brown inhaler? Well done. Good job. Now, I'm not going to tell you you're going to walk out here and you're going to have the best five weeks you've ever had or whatever. This is a battle. The enemy, probably for some of you, we're going to pray in a minute. I'm going to just pray the Holy Spirit comes and ministers. You might find it even more of a struggle. This morning, I was in the car on the way here, and I could feel that anxiety hit me. Why? Because the enemy was having a pop at me, because he knew what I was going to speak on. There is freedom and breakthrough in this room right now. I'm going to declare that right now. I'm going to declare right now that you are going to move in a lifestyle where you can progress out of a lifestyle of anxiety and move fully into your sonship and your daughtership. I declare that over you right now. I'd like you to stand as I'm going to pray.